I think we'll start. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Uh, we uh, we have about uh, we're supposed to have about a dozen organizations here who uh, were involved in grassroots education work in different parts of the world. We also have a live stream. Uh, folks connecting from different parts of the world to listen in to the presentation. So welcome to all. Um, I have behind me uh, two images from a movie that came out in 2000 it's called Blackboards, and it actually won the, the Cannes Film Festival Award. Uh, it's kind of a good analogy for, for thinking about what might happen in the near future. The movie is about teachers, uh, traveling teachers looking for students are caught in conflict, and in particular, a very real conflict in this case. It's about the Iran-Iraq war and kids being involved in war, and teachers really traveling to remote areas looking for students to teach. Uh, and I think we, we can see that possibly we're at that inflection point where these blackboards can be replaced with uh, teachers equipped with, uh, with inexpensive servers and uh, tablets and Wi-Fi routers and um, you know, have a backpack on their back and really take to the streets. So that's very exciting. Um, so Jamie uh, interned with us last year and was thinking about this, this solving this problem of how to provide on offline access. Uh, and in fact, his, his uh, final presentation was about creating an offline instance of <laughs> After he left Khan Academy, he's been continuing to think about this, and uh, his team is here to present that solution to you. Uh, so while Khan Academy is really focused on innovating, evolving our online platform, uh, we're very excited then that, that Jamie and his team are to actively think about how to evolve and uh, innovate this, this offline instance and uh, provide it. Under resource geographies out there. Uh, so, uh, before I hand it over to you, uh, I just mentioned a few housekeeping issues. I think we're we're going to have like a thirty-minute presentation, and then we'll have a, a Q and A for another forty-five minutes or so, and then we'll uh, move down to at twelve thirty. We'll move down to the cafe, and uh, uh, you can have. Uh, Conversations with uh, some of the some of the team members, and they would love to hear about what has brought you here. here what, what areas? What what uh, what aspects are, are you really interested in? So I'll hand it over to Jamie. Thanks, Paul. Thanks everybody for coming, and thanks for having us here. Um, we're very happy to be here. Um, sort of a homecoming for me, having spent the summer here and then coming back. So, just wanted to start out. I'd like to encourage everybody. I wanted to start out with some thank yous because this project is a global effort. Um, there are volunteers around the world, as well as um, here at home, who have been working, dedicating their time, and volunteering to help make this project a reality. Um, so, some of the people are here today, uh, the team over here, and some of the people are connecting in remotely. Uh, presentations from remote. Um, so really big shout out to this global community that we hope to continue growing to support this effort. Some of the organizations that we've been coordinating with to uh, help make this a reality as well and help to expand its reach. Um, Khan Academy, obviously. So without Khan Academy's awesome content and effort and exercises and everything, I'm just going to get uh, started. Um, the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, some people from there will be connecting in like, uh, later. Um, we'll be talking about the Raspberry Pi today, so we'll see uh, how that ties in. Um, the Open Learning Exchange, uh, Richard Rao, is over here. He's going to be saying a couple words later as well. They're, they're very closely aligned in terms of their, uh, their mission and platforms that they're developing for reaching um, offline community and educational content. Um, so we're, we're trying to coordinate as much as possible with them to reach as many people as possible. And Social Print Studio is doing a video in today and is um, helping out with these fun aspects as well. So thank you to them. Uh, most of the drawings in the presentation are done by video uh, and a couple of other images. 
uh, Creative Commons zero open license. We're all about uh, anything to be able to share, be able to share anyway. So um, all of the, this presentation can be reviewed, remixed, and all the things. So we live in very interesting times. We have this global network that binds us all together, allowing us to explore, build communities, learn, and get our voices heard in the world. And for those of us who are lucky enough to be able to access this wonderful resource, uh, the promise of better education, better knowledge, better uh, personal development are all within our reach. And with the recent boom in, in online education, uh, the, the promise of global, universal, uh, high quality education, uh, which is, I think, a pillar of a just and flourishing society, may finally be within our reach. And of course, Khan Academy has been at the forefront of this effort, leading the charge and helping to, to spread educational content to all over the world. Um, it's an inspiring mission. It's very inspiring for, for us as well, especially the emphasis on ubiquity, so education for anyone, anywhere. So there have been a lot of great efforts through Khan Academy to make this a reality with multilingual subtitles. Many of you are probably involved in these efforts, so thank you to all the efforts. Um, and dubbed remixes, so again, uh, trying to translate and make content accessible to local communities. Uh, the internationalization that's now underway to help make the platform go with the entire interface translated. Partnerships with international organizations and schools. A lot of very, very exciting stuff. But what about those that we're still not reaching? Who are we still not reaching? What about the people who are beyond the edges of the, the fringes of this global network? Is this really a problem? What sort of percentage of the population uh, actually has access to the internet? Yeah. So if we look at the numbers, if we look at the numbers, it turns out that only about a third of the world actually has internet access at the moment. Um, most of that, or a large portion of that, in the developed world. Um, in the developing world, the percentages go even lower than that. So only a third of the world has internet access, but it's even worse than that because there's, a, there's an anti-correlation between the number of teachers in an, in an area, and schools in an area, uh, and the amount of internet access. Uh, so, or, sorry, the pupil to teacher ratios. So the more pupils in a single class sharing a teacher, uh, the less internet access there's likely to be. So the populations that specifically would benefit most from access to these resources are the ones who are having the most difficulty access. So there really is a strong need here. So this is what led to us developing this project. Uh, we share Khan Academy's mission to spread education to everybody everywhere. Uh, and we'll tell you a bit today about the efforts we're doing, the direction we're headed, and we want to have a conversation about how we can coordinate. So let's think about how somebody accesses the Khan Academy website right now. So if somebody's using a computer with a browser, they connect through the internet to a server somewhere out there. Out there somewhere in the cloud. So this, this individual is connected to a central server or a set of servers out there in the internet that requires the connectivity. But what if we can flip this and put that server in the classroom? So if we, if we have a remote school that has no internet access, we could put a server in the classroom if we have a platform that we can run on it, uh, and then local clients, cheap Chromebooks uh, or tablets or other, uh, any old computers, because they have very low requirements, can be used to access the content locally. What if we now swap out that server for a very cheap device, the Raspberry Pi is $25 or $35, depending on the version, it can run the entire server, K-Lite server, on, on this device. So this could be a very cheap platform for helping to deploy Khan Academy content to, um, to areas that also have low power uh, availability because this is a very low, uh, low watch device. Question though, how do we get the content to that area in the first place? So it's not maybe as bad as it seems because these countries, there will be areas in the countries that have some connectivity. Perhaps there's a city that has some higher bandwidth connectivity. So people there will be able to use the full platform. 
But then there's also going to be some lower bandwidth connections from these central hubs of connectivity to more rural areas. So whether it's dial-up or 3G connections, for instance, in the West and East Cape of South Africa, so people we've been talking to, the schools there have a single 3G connection shared amongst a school of 1,500 students. So that's not enough for them to stream the content, but it is enough for them to slowly download videos and serve it locally from the school. And then that last mile is really critical as well, because a lot of it is about taking it from the outermost fringes of the, the internet and carrying it by, uh, by foot, by car, as Sal put it in the book, by donkey even. So uh, there are all sorts of mechanisms. Obviously, people move around. This, we have easy mechanisms to synchronize over a physical connection, over a physical sneaker net connection. Then we can take advantage and really extend to cover uh, a much larger proportion. So just to give you a sense of different ways that the platform could be deployed, could be installed on a single computer. So the software would be running on the, the end user's computer, and the browser would be connecting back to itself to access the content. So that's a self-contained uh, on academy platform. The, uh, another option is to have a central server inside the school, like we are talking about, connecting through a router that multiple devices can connect to. The advantage of this is that the teacher can then connect in and view coach reports, view usage data from students in their class. So it can be used as a community building tool and a mentoring tool to help um, guide the local education. So this, is, this part is still in the works, peer-to-peer uh, -peer synchronization, so that it can be completely um, ad hoc and peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, essentially, any two devices that come in contact through some means could synchronize between them. And bidirectional as well, so that the usage data can also sync back to a central server when one of these devices that's been syncing with others comes in contact with the internet. So we can have central reporting, which is important for a lot of organizations that need to have some sort of measurable outcome of the, the efforts that they're doing. So having, having that slow triple back sync um, can be a big advantage there. And so a couple of the technical challenges to this sort of system that, and the way that we've approached them. Uh, the goal of peer-to-peer -peer sync with um, still being able to tell where a piece of data came from and that it hasn't been modified in the meantime. Because if the data is coming from one place and going to another but passing through all sorts of intermediate, untrusted uh, devices in the meantime, we want to make sure that we know where it came from and that it hasn't been kept. So the way this works is through a cryptographic system where each device has a cryptographic key and it can sign uh, any record that the device creates, the database record, uh, so that when it's transmitted to other devices, they'll be able to verify that it came from, from that device. Um, and these kind of devices are then organized into these zones of trust so that you know uh, when you're talking, when a device is talking to another device, it knows that it should be syncing data with that. So that there's something cool. And again, this goal of being able to run on essentially anything. So we we started out with uh, uh, sort of a regular web stack and tried to minimize it down to the bare minimum um, that would still be able to serve the content. So we ended up getting it down to just pure Python code. So there's no dependencies outside of the pure Python code. Uh, so it will easily run on any system that has a Python interpreter. So Windows, Linux, OS X come for free. Uh, and we're looking at, uh, and Richard was talking about there, maybe helping with this perhaps as well, with um, getting it run independently on a, uh, a, an Android tablet or Android phone. So that it could be a self-contained server that could then synchronize when it comes in contact with another device or with the internet. And if it's installed on a USB stick, again, with the sneaker net idea, you can simply plug it into a computer that has Python installed or installed from there and run it directly from the USB stick. So you don't, wouldn't even need to do any installation process. It could run directly from the stick. So I think that's, we're going to transfer over now to Juan, and I'm going to switch the path. Vicky, you're going to be fine. So uh, Juan Wong and Vicky Tu have been working on the project at ECSD, and they're going to talk a bit about the syncing mechanisms. OK, so my main contribution to the KDI project is to design and develop the development page. Vicky, can you go to the updates? So as you see on the top of the download page, besides the video download section, we also provide subtitle 
developed and updates for more than 50 languages. It's very important because the demand for non-English content for, uh, in offline communities is particularly high. So let's talk about uh, this, the download process. So in some cases, an administrator may only want some part of the content due to the limit of storage or bandwidth. So we implement the uh, topic tree for the download page. When an administrator comes to the page, the little circle icons shows what video already being exists on the server. In this case, it seems like um, the multiplication and divisions is already being done in that computers. So um, new or uh, additional content can be selected and downloaded. So let's say if I want to download the multiplication button part, as we see, um, five selected videos. So let's click that button. So when page starts to download, there's a progress bar will be shown that will tell us the administrator how long it will take to download. This is significant for someone who has slow internet speed. Also, in some areas, they um, the bandwidth has different price from day to night. So they can cancel the download process anytime they want, and later they can choose the uh, best time to download the rest of content. Now, Vicky will talk about our new synchronized method. We will implement in the future. OK, so um, the new sync page, we hope to release it pretty soon. But in the meantime, we have a few mock-ups for you. Sorry. OK, so. Um, with this new sync page, users can choose uh, three methods, or one of three methods which they want to use to synchronize their data. So the first method of synchronization is over the internet, and this is currently what's being offered right now. The second method is over a local network, so when two devices come into contact with each other. And the third method is over local media. So this includes USB, flash drives, um, the Raspberry Pi, any other storage media of any type. And this is what facilitates that sneaker net that Jamie was talking about, that last mile of getting a K light to places where there aren't any internet. And then after users choose which method of synchronization they want to use, um, they have four options that they can synchronize. So you can choose to synchronize uh, your software, so getting a software update, updating it to the latest version, and also getting the new exercises or videos if they've been released. You can also choose to synchronize your video downloads, so getting new videos, um, and you'll be able to see like what videos you already have, what exercises, and then choose which ones you want to put onto your device. And this also includes dubbed videos, which Matt and Dylan will be demoing next for us. And you can also choose to synchronize language packs, and this includes subtitles for the videos and any type of language offered, and also for the whole interface, the whole translated interface. And users can also choose to synchronize their user data. So back to video downloads, uh, Matt and Dylan will show us what kind of dumb video we have. So we're going to be talking about internationalization. And as Jamie mentioned earlier, uh, KLite is meant to bridge the gap between offline users and the internet. This is really a global project, and therefore we must fulfill the needs of a global audience. The goal is to reach as many people as possible, and to do this, we must cater to a diverse linguistic community. In order to keep our efforts future-proof, we've adopted standardized methods of internationalization. This has allowed us to utilize open source tools to crowdsource translations. In addition, we'd like to express our gratitude to the translations team here at Khan Academy for providing us with uh, subtitles as well as dubbed videos, and connecting us with a, a vast network of translators and advocates. Uh, we'd also like to express our gratitude to Bill Graham for helping to make internationalization a priority uh, at KLA. Now Dylan's going to take us through a demonstration. That's right, awesome. So just like Matt said, we're uh, using great open source tools. Uh, this is an example of Poodle that we've installed at uh, translate.advoxsync.com. And it's been up for two weeks. And as you can see, um, we've already had people from all over the world um, come in, make a profile, and start translating parts of our code base. So uh, Matt's going to click through there and show you as 
easy as get started. So you pick a language when you register, click on the words in the attention, and you can immediately get started uh, submitting translations of all those strings in the code base. So a really great tool because we can quickly get in there, download the newly translated strings, and integrate them very easily into our code base. So let's take a look at what that all looks like. So we'll log out of there. Cool. So this is the Khan Academy homepage, or um, excuse me, KLite homepage in, uh, in English. Um, and Matt and I have been working really, really hard on integrating a dynamic language switching function down there at the bottom. So you can see we've loaded up a couple of languages. We even have a pirate campaign going on right now, um, <laughs> mostly as creative stress relief. But, um, so even if you're not bilingual, you have no excuse to not visit translate.adhacking.com and make some contributions. Um, so you can see there's Italian, um, and we can switch it over to Chinese or Czech. Um, and you can see it, it happens pretty quickly, and we've also implemented a way of adding the default language. So an administrator that's distributing um, KLite somewhere can set the default language for um, their distribution if they've downloaded the language back that Vicky was talking about. So um, another thing that we're really excited about, like Vicky and Guan showed you, is integrating subtitled videos and dub videos directly into the interface. Um, so if we walk through these videos, the top level. <laughs> Not totally there yet. But um, so Jamie's been working really, really hard on getting the um, HTML5 player working. And along with that comes the option of adding or taking away subtitles. So we'll hear Mr. Khan's voice. Uh, for a second, and then if I only spoke Czech, it would be really nice to have the subtitles integrated right in. So, that can speak. I can narrate. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that, actually. <laughs> so, um, just a quick example of how the subtitles will work, and then if we can um, step out of this. Maybe not. <laughs> so, there, right? Yes, no worries. So let's step out of there. And then um, if we switch it on over to Italian, one of our complete languages on translate.fxsync.com, um, we can show you the exercise interface that has been translated. So step out a little bit now. Oh, yeah. It's, oh, step out. There you go. No worries. <laughs> Next have their own shortcuts. It takes. Um, so um, let's not let's not worry too much about the dev videos. Just trust me that a beautiful Italian woman is going to be speaking if we press play here. Um, and we'll walk into the exercise. So say we finished um, this basic edition video, and you can see that this exercise interface is completely translated into uh, Italian. And that's going to be some on the fly math. Very impressive. Um, and I'm Dosi Punte, I think, in Italian. I don't speak Italian. Um, and so we're really excited about that. And we're also really excited about getting the exercises themselves translated. We're not quite there yet, but we're hoping with the i 18 efforts that are happening here that we can stay in sync um, and get that moving forward. So that's it for us on the internationalization front. And we're really excited about the progress we've made and all the support that we've gotten from all over the world. Um, and so it looks like we've earned some points. So we're going to move over to Richard, who's going to be talking about coach reports and how he's going to be watching us. Um, Deal with those points and our progress through basic edition. So Richard's Richard's back in San Diego. That's right. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Richard is remote right now. He has a real job uh, back in San Diego, <laughs> like the rest of us. So he's going to be um, telling us all about coach reports from there, and then going to TA one of my classes. <laughs> all right. Can you hear me? Okay. I really don't like look at myself that big on the screen. And now, okay, so I'm assuming that you can all hear me. So I'm going to talk briefly about the coach reports. Uh, so this is modeled off uh, a very sparse version of the coach reports used in Khan Academy. And 
So the first page is just a, a very quick presentation of the uh, progress that a group of students has made. Uh, it's only visible to the admin and teacher users. Um, and you, you can only actually monitor the users who are actually part of a particular group. So the first thing to do is you go into the Coach Reports page, uh, is to select the group that, is, uh, that you're going to use, uh, then to look at the topic. So rather than have every single exercise that every user has ever done, uh, we divide it up by the topics provided on the Khan Academy map. And then uh, the list of users down the side gives you all the different users within that subgroup. Um, and then the particular uh, exercises within that topic that they've done. So over the um, actual uh, exercises, you can click through to the particular exercise that they've, been, that they've been doing. So if you look down and see that everybody in the class is struggling with a particular exercise, you can click through to that, see what the particular uh, uh, exercise is, and then possibly for a teacher actually be able to do some intervention there. Uh, the color scheming on the uh, coach report, if it's red, that means that the student has actually been trying uh, at least 30 times to do the exercise and hasn't yet achieved mastery. So maybe they've got, got it right seven times and they broke their run and they've kept on going, but they still haven't quite got there. So the red will give some indication that you might want to do some intervention. Uh, green means that they've started, but they haven't achieved mastery yet, so it's still sort of in progress. And green indicates that they have actually achieved mastery. So we want to go for a very simple, sparse view so that, uh, one, it wouldn't load uh, the sort of low, low performance hardware we were trying to focus on, um, but also so that we can uh, actually just very quickly see a quick visual of what's going on. Um, we'd actually be very interested to see what uh, features that people in the field would like to see in the coach reports, how they'd like to see it expanded. Um, one thing that what needs to be done is actually be able to change user groups. So if we need to move people into classes or out of classes, um, that's something we need to do as a de uh, in development. Uh, also actually be able to look at individual user overviews, so being able to click on a particular user and see how they're doing. Um, and another thing is actually looking, having a coach report view on that central server. So Jamie mentioned that earlier, that there's uh, central data collection for a zone. Uh, so if um, you have a, a, a group deploying the field and they wanted to have an overview of how all the students are doing, um, that's something that we want to work on to actually be able to allow people to get a good overview of how, the, uh, how everyone is working. So Dylan mentioned earlier that as you're doing the exercises, you're accumulating points. So just like on uh, Khan Academy, we do have a point system. Um, so the, um, as you're doing an exercise, uh, when you get it correct, it'll award you a certain number of points. And then it'll add up those points over time uh, as you're doing the exercise, filling up the bar to the point where you actually get up to mastery. When you do get to mastery, then the, that, those points then get added to the total number of points that you have. Uh, until that point, they don't get added on uh, because we don't want people to see the points and then have them taken away when they break their run. Uh, we also have points for videos, just like on the regular Khan Academy site. Um, I think we're actually in the process of uh, making sure that the number of points you get for a video is the same on KA Lite as it is on Khan Academy. Uh, I think that may actually be implemented now. So as you watch through the video, the number of points um, is shown that you've earned so far on the video is shown on the top right hand side, and that will continue to accrue. Um, and then the total number of points you have overall on the site is always visible when you've logged in. So up here on, I've been not working enough, obviously. Um, I've only got 67 points in total. Um, but as I navigate through the site, that is updated uh, every time I do a navigation. So we didn't want to make it dynamically update because we wanted to reduce the load on the client and also pre prevent continual callbacks to the server so we're not overloading the server as well. Uh, but every time you do a navigation event, then that points total will get refreshed. So hopefully as people are working through the site, they will see their points accumulate uh, and change there as well. Um, it also means we don't get that taking away problem when students are working on an exercise and then they break their run. Uh, and then see points taken away, which could be a little bit disheartening, a little bit demotivating. Okay, so I think that's back to Jamie. 
Um, and that's just taking me back to my slides. Okay. Okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. What did I just do? Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, it should be good. Um, sorry. Uh, so, Pradeek is going to talk a bit about uh, low power platforms and just the global, e global economics of uh, the internet. I'm going to switch over to the slides. Um, so, the developers of the I'm going to be Developers of the KOI project are really fascinated by local computing. Um, and we really want it, we really focus on it as the lead hardware platform that we're developing for. Um, and we see that the ability to low cost, the ability to leverage low cost computing is a central principle to what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so most notably, as we've mentioned before, Raspberry Pis are are an affordable service solution and are the primary installation. Um, we really like their infinite flexibility uh, of the platform and their ability to tinker. Um, we've seen plenty of cases, plenty of great, uh, great things that people have done. Um, so we, we've seen things like space imagery, where people have sent uh, Raspberry Pis to space to take images of the Earth. Um, and we've seen super, super, uh, mini supercomputers. Um, but we really see the potential of putting uh, Raspberry Pis in the field. Uh, we feel that it will peak the minds of users in the same way it does anywhere else in the world. Um, and we also think that because of the education platforms that the Raspberry Pi Foundation has built into the community, um, it will be an incredible introduction to computing um, that really hasn't been modeled by other systems to date. Um, we, what really inspires hope in us is that the knowledge gained from tinkering with our pies uh, scales and grows with the user. That's how a lot of us grew to work on the Raspberry Pi. It's from tinkering with it and learning with it. Um, and we feel that this empower, empowers the users to build the environment they want to live in. Um, we also see devices like Chromebooks and Android tablets being great, affordable, flexible introductions to mobile computing. The whole, the whole other aspect that's really taking our world by storm. So um, we want to expose underserved communities to as much as possible. And together, all of these platforms serve as a seed for a complete, uh, connected, and computationally skilled world. Um, so, and it's important that we plant the right seeds, because right now, uh, right now in Western countries, we're dealing with pretty, uh, pretty problematic lawmaking and uh, inequitable control of important infrastructure. Um, even if you've listened to last night's State of the Union, the momentum in Washington is towards a less open internet. So the internet we know is heavily reliant on the political, clim uh, political climates of governments that have generally ignored the communities that we used to serve. Um, and as a result, we end up seeing a, the massive disparity that we see on this map, uh, with the US being having a lot of, tra uh, a lot of traffic, US, European have traffic, but Africa here and in India, there's very little traffic compared to the rest of the world. Um, and this is because the, and this is because we, the infrastructure for reliable access is expensive and not politically beneficial. Um, these submarine cable, uh, submarine uh, data cable lines are, are a huge economic and political endeavor, and have and each of these nodes represents billions of dollars of, of you know, capital and uh, political lobby. So in regions like Ghana and rural India, the people don't have this type of lobby. And, for access, and they don't have the type of capital to build the infrastructure themselves. And so what comp compounds this issue is that without the digital, modern digital economies, they can't even earn the money to build, to build the infrastructure to get at the access and the voice they want. But the hope is not lost um, for seeing these communities catch up. We've already seen that projects like Google Fiber in Kansas City have rapidly expanded the economy of, of that city. And the rapid growth is, is probably our desire for the communities that we're serving. So while we don't have $28 billion now to spend in the, in the communities that are using KOI, um, we do have low-cost computing to create, the, to create alternative types of infrastructure. So low-cost computing for education makes our mission possible. So, We've seen things like the Akash tablet program, which um, 
which passed through the Indian government very quickly, and it's, it had a low, uh, low capital investment. Um, and this is because, because of those two issues, because of those two benefits, it was able to pass through quickly. Um, so despite having, I know, sort of freaking out. <laughs> so so despite having despite having less despite having less connectivity through low cost computing platforms, we're, there's still going to be there's still going to be a demand for data that drives the need for uh, human infrastructure, so for human networks that will that will serve as a as a stand-in for uh, high speed internet access. And and so the path to discovering this ad hoc infrastructure will be a collaborative process, um, and it's and and part of this collaborative process is finding out neat and engine, uh, neat and innovative things like these Raspberry Pi supercomputers that were built um, purely out of interest and, and, and collaboration. Um, so yeah, so the, the so we feel that we, we're really passionate about low cost computing. Um, to connect that. Um, um, so we're going to transition into discussion shortly. Um, just wanted to end on something uh, the section that um, that really comes back to this issue of open access and getting as many materials out there as possible. So there is already a lot of great content um, under licenses that allow it to be distributed offline. So for those of us who have the internet. There's a lot of free content that isn't actually free in the sense of being open licensed and able to be distributed in a peer-to-peer -peer network. So what about all of that content? How can we encourage people to get more and more content into the into Creative Commons or open licenses that allow us to, to spread it more broadly? So we're thinking about this idea of the offline commons. So this is a way to encourage people to license their content such that it can be distributed through these sorts of mechanisms and get out to as many people as possible. So we're uh, going to now transition into um, some question stuff, but we want to um, tie in a couple of people. We're just going to check if we uh, on this one. So, do we have anybody? So the Raspberry Pi Foundation maybe point um, for now. So I'd like to introduce Richard Rao to talk for a couple minutes about the ways that they're using um, Raspberry Pis and other educational technologies in the sneaker net um, and hoping to work with us together very shortly uh, to help distribute K Light in their field efforts in um, uh, Ghana and other places around the world. So thank you very much. <clears throat> when, when I talk about open learning exchange <clears throat> and what we're attempting to do which is to reach virtually every child, particularly the most marginalized children of the world, with a high quality education. And uh, particularly a focus on girls who tend, tend to be the ones who are the least, uh, have least access to basic education. Um, I, I often start out with what you've just heard. And, and when, we, when we begin to talk and, and connect with each other and the, and the team at, at KA Light, I was just amazed at how closely aligned both the nature of the problem as has been described here and the nature of the solution is between these two organizations. We are, we are working primarily in, in Asia. We have a strong program in, in Nepal. We have strong partners in India, uh, uh, Rwanda, Uganda, and a big program on basic literacy in Ghana. Let me talk to you mainly about the Ghana program where, where we are actually actively piloting some of the KA light materials as we speak in, in a program that involves 20 schools and 5,000 elementary school students. Um, we, we, again, our, our basic assumption has been, number one, that um, to reach all of the children, you have to be off the internet, you have to be able to be off the internet, and you have to be able to be off the electric grid. It has to be low power enough that you can reach every child and generate local, local Local, uh, local power, whether it's a solar cell. Uh, one of our schools is using a carousel where the kids actually generate electricity by running a carousel around in a circle or bicycles. There are a number of sources for low power. And one of the beauties of the, of the Raspberry Pi 
is that it requires so little power. Our, our, our toolkit, if you will, for, 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 for education starts with the assumption that you don't start with the tool, you start with what kind of education you want to have, what kind of people and leadership you need to have, what kind of content, and then you say, what are the tools we need in order to accomplish that? So we focus very much upon the use of coaches in the classroom with the teacher, demonstrating activity-based learning, project-based learning, and problem-solving on an individualized basis. And we find that, 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 that coach in the classroom working with teachers and students together is transformational in the way they think about learning and where they begin to learn how to learn themselves rather than just have the information poured into them. We say there are three key parts to education. One is learning that which has been known. Second is discovering things that have never been known, what's in the pond out there. And third is creating things that have never existed before. So we're focusing on all three of these things, learning, discovery, and creation, not just learning what has been known. In order to do this, we started out with the assumption there needs to be a powerful library of resources, of mainly open source resources, that are available to the remotest kind of school, the remotest kind of community in the world. So when Raspberry Pi came, came uh, just shortly, we've been looking a lot. We started with laptops, very expensive, doesn't scale. Raspberry Pi is the first server that we think really has the possibility of scaling. We're also able to find some very powerful tablets for $50 out of China who look and feel just like a, a, a Nook or a Kindle and, and function very much in that way, Android-based. And so we now have moved to the point of saying, we kind of internally say, well, we need not only KA Lite, but we need KA Extra Lite. Extra light being the ability to have this work on a tablet away from the server, brought back then and synced to the server, and we're using CouchDB to do that, so that we're able to sneaker that that you talked about from the student who has an individual sign-on and who has a profile of what their age, their gender, their grade level is, so the data that we can begin to feed back through the system is incredible. It doesn't even exist in the United States today. But with this technology that, that is being developed here at KA Life, the K Life team, and with the field test that we have, 20 schools, 5,000 students at the elementary level, we'll be able to actually work through the issues, and there are many issues. It's, we make, make it sound easy, but it's not going to be easy. To actually demonstrate in a way that can be scaled. Our technology in Ghana that we're now using, we've got the cost down to $4 per student per year when we amortize the cost over time. That begins to be a scalable budget item that you can go to a government and you can say, there's no reason that every child in this country, every child in Africa, every child in Asia cannot now, from a cost point of view, actually have access to high quality basic education. So that's our mission and we're so excited about working with you guys. It's really wonderful. Thank you. Thing actually wanted to do as well. So this is something that's very exciting, partly because it's this international team that's been developing this. This is Hui um, in Portugal. Uh, in the last week, I uh, put together a Windows installer to make this uh, this process really simple. I forced him to cut down. Looks like it went up to 44 seconds. To cut it down to 30 seconds, just to give you a sense of of this process. No music. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, an installer, you run through, fill in information about your server, um, and then you have something that gets minimized to the tray that you can start and stop the server with and load it up in the browser. Um, so, we're, this is the sort of push that we're doing right now is ease of installation, ease of deployment, and ease of syncing. So, yeah, thanks, Huey, for that. We uh, stayed up all night finishing this, uh, even though I had an exam this morning. Uh, so. <laughs> He's uh, very dedicated to the cause, and he's a, a, an undergrad student in the uh, University of Porto. Cool. So um, we want to move to questions now. Uh, I'm sure there are questions here. We want to. We had this moderator board that you have. Uh, yes, we want to just start yes. with that and bring the team up as well, um, so that we can all answer questions as, as appropriate. 
Uh, and then we can move into uh, questions that you might have as well. So we'll go through some of these and then get to the global questions. So just one minute. Um, Sorry, Jimmy uses Linux. So, making sure that they remote can see this. Cool. Okay, we're good. Sorry. Any questions? Yeah, thank you. So, these were the top questions. So, people posted these questions and then voted them up. Um, the question about how we stay in sync, I think there's there's two things that's being asked there. One is how do we make sure that just the content is, is, is coming down um, and getting uh, getting downloaded. So we're using the Con API to download um, the new topic tree and then be able to download new videos from the, the hosted videos. So the, we're able to, we don't have to do any manual intervention to incorporate new content. That's an automatic process to the API. Um, and then the, the other question that comes up multiple times through sort of a recurring theme in here is, local content creation. And this is something that's very important to us as well. Uh, because obviously there are not only language, but cultural and content issues with local communities. Uh, so we want to find a way to enable local content creation so that both local community can be formed around this content, but also so that their voices can get heard in the broader community, so they can have a global voice. So that's definitely very core to our, to our mission, is allowing local communities to generate content and share that as well. So Everybody uh, connected. Um, so, yeah. How do you exercise the same thing? With the software, yeah. So the software update includes yeah. all exercises. We pull con exercises in. Um, yeah. So if we add exercises, it's automatically going to be included there. We'll update it very soon. Do software updates happen continually? Or uh, is it like a slower process? When there's internet, sorry, through the sneaker net. So, like when he was showing earlier, there's sort of different mechanisms. Yeah. So we, we're currently using Git for updates, so it's just people do a Git poll. So that it requires the internet. Includes the k -Lite software and run exercises. Is like that. So that's thinking it'll have the newest version of our software. Language packs will have open demo files for the translations. Um, and then you can, it'll have the new topic tree data. So then you can download the video. That's the topic tree for the download page will be updated. So we'll be able to download the newest video. Yeah. Okay. On the, on the content organization part, mm -hmm. um, some of the exciting things uh, Khan had me with these is tutorials uh, mm -hmm. for content organization. Um, and as, as Khan had me keeps going, the content organization gets better. Mm -hmm. So one of the concerns we had was that the content organization, the innovations being done at Khan Academy, would be available. Right, so there's there's sort of two aspects of that. One is the actual interface, so the awesome stuff with the topic pages and the tutorialization. There's there's that aspect where we want to look at how to incorporate uh, some some basic set of those into it. But there's also the just in terms of the structure, so the topic tree is that the question? So so that comes automatically from the API. So when we pull the API, we have the full the, the topic tree, the hierarchy, and content will then be or viewed within the new hierarchy that we've pulled through the API. So when you update the software, it has the new hierarchy. So that, that sort of comes for free through the awesome on, on API that's been, that they're providing. Um, yeah, so yeah, feel free that we're using these as sort of jumping points for discussion. So feel free to jump in with questions when there's something that ties in with the things we're looking at. Uh, so lessons, exercise, progress tracking, I think we've basically looked at that, multiple users on a device. The Raspberry Pi, we haven't done extensive tests, but it looks like it can support about 20 users at least, um, accessing it simultaneously with client devices. Um, the, uh, so different exercise versions. So this is a question about actual co uh, content creation again. So um, I think down the road, this is a direction we'd like to, to move. Um, for now, we'll be sort of feeding off of the excellent work that uh, Khan Academy is doing on, on translating the, or internationalizing the Khan Exercises platform. So we'll be able to incorporate that. Yes, I have a question. How do you prioritize where to go? I know you're still in the pilot stage right now because <laughs> see everything looks well. Um, when you look at the data, right? Like 75% of it. Like, but how do you prioritize? And the reason I ask is because I run all three of these in different countries. Right now we have six, but the opportunity level is about 20. So let's move on to pilot and partner with you. How do I go about that? Right, so, so prioritizing. 
you mean in terms of developing the, the, the direction we're going or in terms of partnerships? Yeah, so um, right now we're, we're sort of a distributed community. We're not an organization per se. Uh, we're looking at trying to figure out what the best way to, to be some sort of organization to handle this offline commons idea. Um, so right now it's contact us. We're trying to write up basically as, as many detailed documents as possible describing different deployment scenarios and grow it out from there. So when people have questions about potential deployments, uh, then we, uh, we add that to the documentation and direct them there so that it's accessible for everybody. So we can grow that around. In terms of being able to do it, there's no it's, there's no official partnership that's necessary. Um, it's just a matter of having some people on your team that are able to get into the places and set up the hardware, install the software, and, and manage that. But we're trying to make that as frictionless as possible. Yeah. Well, one, uh, actually, I'm just curious about what the team, what, what everyone does. Uh, mm -hmm. It sounds like some of you all are UCSD students, or yeah, just to make up. I, I, I'm sure. really curious about that, and also just what the current uh, usage is and, and where you see it. Yeah, okay. Um, do you want to maybe introduce yourself somewhere? Where, what? Yeah, so I'm Matthew. I'm a linguistics undergrad at UCSD, and I've been uh, working with Jamie as a research assistant for about a year now, and this has been our newest and most exciting. And he has a lot of work on his research. <laughs> <laughs> well, research is kind of a broad term. Oh, yeah. This is, yeah, it's which is the other uh, my name is Dylan Barth. I'm a fourth year cognitive science student with a specialization in human computer interaction at UCSD. And I started with Jamie about a year ago, um, taught me how to program, and now we're just building cool stuff. So. And you're teaching me how to program. Yeah. So I'm Prasid Pramod. Um, I'm a graduate of UCSD. Um, I went to, I was a CODSA undergrad, and I spent a lot of time in Jamie's office just tinkering around with stuff and arguing and debating and stuff. Um, so I do a lot of testing with the, of the interfaces as well as with the Raspberry Pi. Um, I have some background in hardware, so I know how to mess around with it and try to get the power envelope lower and the cost lower of the actual hardware packages. Um, I work with Social Print Studio and uh, as a designer, um, and hopefully that will become more and more important as we work with uh, partner organizations. My name is Wang Wang, and uh, I joined Jamie because uh, I was the first user of his previous project, the uh, ESL Genie, and later i um, starting to be a developer with the project and carry on this quarter working on KLI project as well. And um, I study um, coincide with uh, human computer interaction uh, as well. And my main contribution is the, the download page, um, the design, the interaction flow, things like that. So I mean, work on the front end. So. Um, I'm Vicky too. I'm also an undergrad at UCSD, third year, uh, specializing in CogSci HCI as well. So I've actually been working with Jamie for roughly two years now. Uh, but yeah, I started out on another project and then moved on to learning how to program Python. And now we're on to KLite. Usage. Usage. Yeah, usage it. So um, it's we've had hundreds of downloads, thousands of emails, and things. So it, it's hard to sort of gauge the actual usage. Data is starting to trickle back, but since we don't have the full peer-to-peer -peer system set up, not everything trickles back. Um, but we've probably emailed, had conversations with people in 20 or so countries uh, interested in deploying. And they're like Richard, for example, there they have stuff on the ground. They're testing it out with schools, with the, the Raspberry Pi hardware. Um, so it's definitely getting out there and getting a lot of usage. A lot of it is invisible. That's the interesting thing. So we're, we're trying to encourage as much of, as possible so the synchronization. Exactly. It'll be interesting to experimentally determine Exactly. And then we, so can, we can estimate the, the total usage. Um, but we're definitely, we recognize the importance of having central analytics. Um, so as much as possible, that can sync back. Yes, with, with, with the project in Ghana, we'll have, we'll have data on each individual user by age, gender, uh, uh, first language, grade level, and, and how they have evaluated their comments and evaluation of the various resources that they use. So it'll be a, a several PhD pieces uh, easily that will be able to be generated. We'll be generating that on a regular basis, at least monthly, hopefully twice a month, from 5,000 students in the field, in these villages around Ghana. What did they use? How did they react to it? Uh, what progress have they made? So 
that'll be a, a, a enormous amount of data. And in terms of uh, how do you set priorities, we're trying to get it from the ground up. So there's what do the teachers in the school say they need that they don't have? How do they, if, if, here's a five star thing that should, here's a one star thing that needs to be sent back to be fixed. All right, so we're, we're really trying to get priorities set from, from the classroom and the teachers and the students themselves. And I have to run a second, I just want to tell you all, it's frankly incredible what you all are doing. I mean, look, we've, we've been talking about this kind of stuff forever. So it's a hard problem, and it's going to, but if you guys are actually doing it, and the team here is pretty tired of me quoting Carlos Slim, uh, but uh, just to give you some context, we recently went out of Mexico, the Slim Foundation, I actually think they're going to be probably pretty interested as well. But uh, he was talking about how he thinks everyone should have a four-day work week. I don't know, that might be a good idea. Maybe we'll do that at Khan Academy. He's like, no, 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 no. And so why not? For you guys, millions of people are waiting. So that's heavy stuff. And so I, I say that every now, but you guys are really the, the cutting edge of that. I mean, in terms of literally millions of people are waiting. It's all thanks to you. No, no. no. <laughs> thanks, Bobby. <for having me. laughs> and. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, questions? Yeah. Yes, uh, Jim Kessel. Yeah. Um, I listen to the idea of offline stuff all the time, right? Uh, so, are you, is this an international thing? Are you guys also doing this in places in the US? I mean, there's places in Vermont that don't have connectivity. That's uh, amazing that we haven't actually brought this up yet today because yeah. one of the biggest use cases um, that we that's emerged after we launched the project has been prisons in the US. So medium security prisons, uh, they have often schools, they have computer labs, they need educational resources, but they can't give them online access. So there's been an explosion of interest. That's been actually one of the major points of interest within the US. There also there have been communities, there's one group of talking to Grand Rapids. And we hear, we hear from people all the time that they wish they could do offline with kids that don't have access. Yeah, at home, at home exactly. And so that's where this last mile thing comes into it. So the school may have access, but it's about taking it home and being able to work on it at home. So combining um, uh, low power, devi cheap devices that kids can take home, have it sync, come back to school, sync up the data, the teacher can measure them, uh, be able to work on it. Uh, yeah, just need to get Yeah, it'd be great for yeah, I, was, I was wondering yeah. about that. Yeah, that's yeah. one thing I was thinking about a lot. So yeah, very, very thing. There is a lot of interest in the U.S., um, so, which surprised us because yeah. it was our, our, our target. Indian reservations. Indian reservations. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the Boston school system. The Boston school system. Boston school system. Boston school system. Boston school system. Um, so we want to try and get to a couple more of these. Keep keep jumping in um, because uh, stuff can feed off of this. Um, and I think so, uh, this next one actually comes into uh, what we were talking about before with the local content creation. Um, so if we empower people locally to create their own content and share it within their local communities, as well as within their country and with the world, and have other people translate that so we can get this global voice out there, um, I think that fits in very well. I think that's what's being asked by this question. So allowing the local traditions, local culture, local languages to, uh, to spread. Uh, I wanted to expand on that. I think the, the other real cool thing is when I was talking about like the innovation. Um, you know, these by putting these small cheap devices, they we're giving them the opportunity to like really just tinker with it and create new solutions we may not even be able to think of. Um, that because of their local traditions, they have a particular insight that we will never have an insight into. And working with them and collaborating over a sneaker net or an ad hoc system or even the internet itself. Who knows what will happen? This is a big platform for innovation. Cre creation. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And community. Community is very. This one is ready, ready to uh, deploy or you are it's, So it is being deployed. It's ready to deploy. We're trying to just continually improve the deployment process. So one of the, the key things that I think um, are pain points right now are the updating process. So right now it uses Git. So that first requires Git to be installed and then requires access. So we're working on a package so that it'll be a zip file that's signed by the central server to verify that it's the right the actual package, uh, which will then just kind of get unzipped over its own. So, so updating the processes that can be used in peer to peer network. Um, that'll be coming soon, probably two to three weeks. Um, so that's the, the major endpoint. And then the peer to peer synchronization. But the, the system works entirely. So, yeah, you can, put it on, you can put it on a computer, you can send it off, use it. Uh, we also have a, a BitTorrent file to, to ease that, that initial download process. Yeah, the majority of the files. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, yeah, so it works fine on Mac. You know, anything that runs Python. So it works fine on Mac, uh, Linux, Windows. We're, we're working on a Debian package, also a package for the Raspberry Pi. That would be, and, and I was hoping they'd be on here. Do you have anybody? Yeah. Which I find is here. Perfect. So, um, so, that's, um, so that leads into that. Yeah. Um, getting to the so, Jack, if we can uh, switch to you for a moment just to uh, uh, hear from you about uh, the way that you guys are interested in helping to extend or use, uh, use KA Lite with the Raspberry Pi platform. So, Jack Lang is the chair of the Raspberry Pi Foundation, uh, and is, uh, we've been having conversations with them to try and get this out to as many people as possible. Do we have this audio? So, you have to mute the mic on that one. It's your picture. Uh, can you try speaking, Jack? Or maybe this is all that needs to be. Can you try with speaking, Jack? That was broadcasting to it. Yeah, I think we need to start on the other camera. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Don't. This one is. We should need this one. This is something we're all familiar with, right? Mike? All familiar with. Oh, never mind. Jack. Well, so, yeah, he's, he's just like the guy. <clears throat> so, does Jack need to unmute him? Can't hear, can't hear, can't hear, can't hear. Um, so now this is.
that, that, that. That's that must be just so is it is it better now? It looks like we're Yeah. It's, it's worse. And I'm hearing I'm hearing too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait, I thought he was talking. Oh, and that was me talking. Oh, yeah. uh, oh but maybe it was uh, Are you uh are you there Have you I mean the speaker is on that one. I turned the speaker up. I think that was what was causing the feedback, right? Oh, yeah. That's really good. Okay. It's just where we look. Yeah. Okay. So this is a this is a tricky issue. How can so if an area in the future has internet access, how can we sync back with that? Um, right now the basic answer is you can't. So this is an independent platform that doesn't synchronize usage data back to the live on Academy website. Um, we will look, we're talking, talking, chatting about ideas, maybe you could get a badge and transfer, or not transfer over your credits, but say, I've now come out of this uh, offline platform and using the live on Academy website, and we try and provide some transitional tools to be able to link in from an online version of KLite and jump into the places where you left off on the live on Academy website. But because the, the data that we're storing is quite different, it probably won't be integrated uh, directly. The data won't transfer over here. Uh, gamification, so like you saw, we do have points. Um, there is progress tracking, so it shows you on the tree what you've accomplished. Um, we don't have badges yet. We're going to look at a, a basic badge system, because that could be important for motivation. Um, we talked about um, detention facilities, timetables, so it has actually been released. I think we're getting into some repeats here. So because you guys are, are here, let's try and address any issues that you might have. Do you, are there any other questions um, that you have? Well, actually, I was just going yeah. to give one highlight. Uh, this is exactly what we have. We have the videos, tutorials translated. We have distributed those software and versions of tablets. Mm -hmm. This is um, a I work with an organization for travel. And I have that. And this is the next thing that we want to hear. Uh, right now, we have exercises, hard copy exercises, uh, that we have created and distributed to the students, and it has been very helpful. Yeah. Uh, the next thing that we want to do is actually have uh, the exercises available, or some so, portion of it. Right, so the exercises are incorporated into the platform. I think what's being asked with this question is being able to run it not on a local server, but on a server, say, within a country, and be able to allow them to modify it and adapt it. Um, and also the different language. Right. So the so I think we're going to be feeding off of the the Khan Academy's efforts to internationalize the, um, the exercises platform, um, but uh, we're we're and then so that will be part of our platform and hopefully eventually or soon for some languages on the live Khan Academy website as well. So uh, you showed the uh, platform in a couple of different languages. So the exercises are translated. The exercise, so as you're saying, that's com that's coming as we incorporate oh. the efforts from Khan Academy. So the exercise interface is translated. Uh, the exercise content itself uh, is quite a Herculean effort, and so it's great that they're tackling that. Um, but uh, that will be incorporated in that as we can integrate the work Yeah, in the next three months, we'll be able to start translating the exercises on Khan Academy platform. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, and then, so that will basically help us solve that. Nice. Yeah. Exactly. So then, so this question was, was about having a central server in the country that's regionalized but online. Mm -hmm. So I think if, if people have internet access, we want to direct them to the live Khan Academy website so they can get that full experience. Uh, but uh, and so that internationalization will be coming to the live platforms. Well. I would just say in in the in the open learning exchange model, the, the national library, national digital library that that we're helping the government create will be exactly what you're talking about. And that will be the source 
for feeds, both online and sneaker net, to the schools themselves. Okay. So that in Ghana, a lot of these kids, they want to know what, just like in prisons, they want to know what content is actually being made available to the schools. Mm -hmm. So that filter will be a very part, important part of the model. How much scalable is uh, a single a light yeah. server? Yeah, it's a good question. So it depends on the hardware. Um, it also depends on how it's being installed. So what we've the base installation that, that we recommend is designed for uh, a small deployment. So it's pure Python. It runs with a Cherry Pie server, uh, which is Python that 
Um, it's fully encapsulated. It doesn't require Apache or a database server. It uses everything that's built into Python. So with that one, on a fast computer, you could probably get 50, 100 users. Um, if you want to install something for a large number of users, um, it would be off of probably, you'd install a fuller web stack with Apache, um, a fuller database, and, and you can integrate that well. The, the project's written in, in Django um, and can be integrated in with a regular web stack and then should theoretically be able to support um, as much hardware as you can throw at it, essentially. Okay. On the other hand, how often you synchronize with the server at So that depends on how uh, how often there's internet connectivity. Uh, right now, no, it, no, no. It, or, mean, your version. Oh, our version. Um, we we pull in probably every couple days, every week. We don't have an automated process for that yet, but that will be the next step as well, where it automatically pulls in and does a does a push, um, so that the package will be available for any devices that then hook up. Right. But um, yeah, every every week, so. Okay. Yep. Do you need another question about the financial sustainability yeah. initiative? Yeah, it's a good question. So we're looking at becoming um, an organization potentially to help foster this project and other similar open source projects. Um, obviously, there are different business models to explore. But most, I mean, in the beginning, it's a it's a team of volunteers. Um, hopefully, with if we need to grow to full-time positions, then um, then donation perhaps. But uh, we don't have uh, a specific business model in place. We're trying to just um, we're all volunteers. Is this already established as a five one security? No, oh. no. We're we're looking at the process. That, that's the yeah, yeah. We're just trying to figure out the what exactly it would look like. Do you have a time frame for that? Um, we're probably going to try and start some paperwork in a couple weeks. Uh, I've heard that it can take up to six months to complete. I don't know if that's realistic. Probably a couple months for getting the stuff in there. But for the full status, probably it might take six months. Good advice on that. Yeah, and so we'd love to chat with, with people who have experience in that field. This is new for a lot of us. We do have people that are interested in being on the board, uh, but we're trying to figure out um, the, the direction moving moving forward. So you, you said you deployed this already. Where yeah. have you deployed? Inside US or outside? Uh, there are people, I mean, there are a lot of people that have been testing it, sort of testing in the schools. Uh, testing it out, seeing how it works. We don't have official numbers, like uh, the response to Sal's question earlier. Um, but uh, in the US, there are um, three prison states with prison systems that have been experimenting with it, um, and a group in Grand Rapids um, that's looking at using it in some school areas there. Uh, South Africa, we've talked to, I think, four or five different groups, schools, and organizations there that are experimenting with it in the field. Um, and there are a number of groups in India that we know have been using it. So there are a lot of places where we know somebody's installed it, and they've set up zones, they've set up the organization. We don't know how much usage there is yet, because we haven't done uh, done that push. And we're, we don't have the bandwidth yet to just uh, be constantly um, communicating with each of them. But um, it's being yeah, it's being deployed and experimented with. And sort of people are piloting and testing it out in probably about 20 countries. All right, so we'll, we're going to migrate um, downstairs. We'd love for you to stick around and, and chat with us. Um, and again, if your organization, if you want to talk about the organiza your organization's needs and how this could be useful for them, um, if we can get footage of that too, then that would be really helpful for, for our cause and for, um, for getting this out to as many people as possible. Okay, I had seven Phoenix actually, so I'm up here. Okay, I did some fun. I can talk about what we do for the complex and how that's been a big question about online.